You will now be placed into the conference. A few more analytic techniques using SAS, and we'll just basically keep building on uh, what we've learned so far. So, so just as an overview, uh, I'm just going to go back and revisit just SAS as an overview again just quickly, and then um, today we're going to talk about, as I said, some advanced data manipulation techniques. Uh, and really it's merging data sets, which I think is probably the most important data manipulation technique um, that you'll learn. And then I'll talk a little bit about using arrays and then some basic macros, which are both techniques to help refine your code and do things a little bit more quickly and easily. So just as an overview again in SAS, the, the purpose of, or uh, for our purposes, there's really two things that you can do in SAS. There's basically a data step and a procedure step. And I have only introduced one procedure step so far, and that was working with some formats uh, in the last session. Uh, but as I said, we're going to get more into that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, but uh, last week, uh, we really focused on the data step, as we're also going to focus on today. And last week, we talked about reading in the data and, and creating and redefining variables and subsetting the data and working with dates and formats. Uh, and today is really going to lead a little bit beyond that and look at some more advanced things. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is actually merging data sets. Um, and merging data sets really is the term that we use when we're trying to sort of put two data sets together or weave two data sets together. Um, and really, there's this term one-to-one -one and one-to-many. Um, one-to-one merging is the most simple form, and this is where you have two data sets that you want to put together, and there's some sort of key that allows you to put them together, and that there's only one record uh, per key in one data set, and then the second data set, there's also only one record per key. So you're basically just going to push them together. And that's the most uh, simple form of this. And, and then it gets a little bit more complicated when there's one-to-many matching or many-to-many -many matching, uh, as you can imagine, where there's multiple records by the key in each of the data sets, and you're trying to put them together. You have to think about what will actually happen in SAS. And we're going to go through some examples and show you how to do this. Um, and the thing I just want to remind people here is, is that when we're talking specifically about the SIPC data is that it is relational. And so given that SIPC is a relational database, and we talked a little bit about this um, in the last session, is um, you know you're in a many-to-many -many merging situation when you want to start putting um, various components of the data set together. And the whole idea behind a relational data set is just to facilitate, in fact, this idea that you would have various tables that would have um, many repeats of information by some identifiable key. And so this is, is that you know, you'll have multiple diagnoses per single individual. You may have multiple relapses per single individual. You may have multiple administrations of chemotherapy for single individual. Um, and so all of those things mean that you sort of get this many-to-many -many situation when you actually want to try to put the data sets together. Um, and so this is really what we're going to talk about today. So just a little bit of an overview again of the SIPC data structure. So I'm just going to show you a couple of components of the SIPC data structure and how we might be able to put them together. So when you get your SIPC data, as I said last time, it, it would come in, in multiple tables, uh, multiple pieces, uh, and each piece refers to a particular aspect of data that you were interested in. The info table is really the patient table, and in, in this case, uh, the data set that I requested here that we're actually using as demo is uh, the only piece of information that comes off the patient table uh, is gender. So in this table, it includes the SIPC ID and gender, and then ultimately a source variable. But here, we're really just interested in gender, and the linking key, of course, is the SIPC ID. And of course, the other table that we might want to link the gender to is the actual diagnostic table. And of course, the diagnosis table, uh, again, in a, in a relational database, it's because you can have multiple diagnoses per person, but we would only enter the person information once into the data set. So here we have the SIPC ID again, which is what actually would be able to link these two uh, tables together, and then we have a number of other information or data elements that are in relationship to the actual diagnosis. And then moving on from that, you might have a treatment plan um, for each diagnosis, and you might actually have multiple treatment plans because someone could stop a treatment plan or have a relapse or uh, become toxic on therapy, and so you would actually make a change in, in your plan. Um, and so you can have multiple plans, many multiple plans actually per individual diagnosis, uh, depending on what was happening with the patient. And so here you would link not only by SIPC ID, but you'd also link by, the, by their diagnosis ID so that you would be able to link the treatment plans that are associated with that diagnosis back to the correct um, diagnosis in the diagnosis table. 
So again, this is just sort of an overview of how a uh, relational database work and how this is specifically in SIPC. So coming back now to merging the data sets in general, and I think the best way to think about merging is that you always want to control the merge, and I'll explain what I mean by controlling the merge. But even in, in the simplest situation where it's a one-to-one -one matching situation, you really want to check and ensure that what happened is what you expected to happen. So you should have some pre-idea of what you think should be happening. Um, Muted. You should check to make sure that that happened. And so I always control every merge that I do. And there's a lot of times that there's um, duplicates in tables where I don't think there should be duplicates. And that causes me a little bit of concern in the fact that I will then have to go and investigate why that is. So I always have some sort of a preconceived notion of what should be happening, and I check to make sure that that's actually what happened. So what do I actually mean by controlling the merge? Um, so when you merge two data sets in SAS, you have the option of creating these things called in flags. And the in flags themselves are actually just binary variables that are created on the new merge data set that you want. And they're created by SAS, and they basically have a dichotomous value to them. They're either a zero or a one. And so the in flag says it's one if that record was actually in the particular data set that the in flag was created for. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail in a minute. And zero if it was not in that data set. And so it's with these in flags that you can actually control what, um, what uh, rows, I guess, of data are being merged together or stitched together in the merge statement. Now, these in flags can be temporary, or you can actually save them if you want to keep them for further analysis. In most cases, I just keep them uh, actually only to control the merge, and then I get rid of them. But just to, just to review from uh, where we were last time, so this is the code from the last session. Um, and here, um, you can see that we have data D1, which is, I usually go label the data sets based on what's coming into them. So D to me is always a diagnosis table. So we have data D1, which is the first diagnosis data set that I'm creating, and I set inside it the diagnosis details. So this is, that's the raw data that, that came from my data request. And here, again, just sort of walking through, I say if the definitive diagnosis data is, is not missing, so it's not equal to missing, then um, calculate this DX date. And in actual fact, what I'm doing here is taking the DX date that's stored in the definitive diagnosis variable, which is not a SAS date, and just converting it into a SAS date is essentially what I need to do. Um, and that's so that I can use it later on as a SAS date. And I talked about that last time, why you would want everything coded as a SAS date. And then I drop the definitive diagnosis date because I don't need it once I've converted it into a SAS date, and then I apply a format to it and a label. And then the next step here is, is that I actually sort that data set by SIPC ID and DX date. And what that's going to do is it's going to order any people or individuals in the data set that have multiple diagnoses. It's going to put the first recorded diagnosis in the data set um, at the top. And so I now create DX or D2, which is diagnosis um, table 2, and I set into it D1. So I take that entire D1 data set that I created and set inside it. But now I've set it by SIPC ID. And it's that by variable then that allows me to create this first dot SIPCID equal to one. And this first dot and, and last dot is really similar to these in flags that I'm going to explain about when we do the merging. But essentially by setting it by SIPCID and, and then saying um, if first dot SIPCID equals one, I take basically the first diagnostic record I have for every patient. And then subsequently, I actually go on further and say, actually, I'm only interested in ordinal primary equal ones. I'm actually interested in their first primary diagnosis, not necessarily just their first diagnosis registered in SIPC. And so not only do I have to take their first diagnosis in SIPC, but then I actually have to check whether it, in fact, was an ordinal primary. Uh, and I do that with that final line of code. So that gets us to D2, which is basically now a data set of taking people with their first primary um, in our data set. So as I said here, this is just a little bit of an aside, and this is looking at that first dot uh, and last dot uh, availability. But when you set a data set by something in SAS, um, by a variable, it does create these first dot and last dot flags. And again, all this flag is basically doing is it's saying, look, 
if I'm setting this data set by SIPC ID, here is a, an example of some data that might be in it, and here is the flag for first.sipsy ID and last.sipsy ID. So if you look at um, SIPC ID 1000, you'll notice here on the first.sipsy ID it has a 1. So it says this is the first time I'm seeing SIPSI ID 1000 in this data set. And then last.sipsy ID is equal to 0. So this is telling me that this is not the last time that I'm going to see it. So if I go to the next record, remember I, this, I've ordered this data set by SIPSI ID. So if I go to the next record in the data set, it's also SIPC ID 1000, and the, SIPC, the first dot SIPC ID is now equal to zero. So this says this is not the first time in the data set that I'm seeing this SIPC ID. And if I look at last dot SIPC ID, it's now equal to one. And so it's saying this is the last time that I'm seeing it. So this is how you can see how the first and last are working. Now when I subset that data, originally I said just keep everyone where the first dot SIPC ID is equal to one. So it would just select the ones where there's a one. But as you can see for SIPC ID um, 1002, it is actually only one record, so the first dot SIPC ID and the last dot SIPC ID are identical, they're both equal to one. For variable, or for SIPC ID 1003, you can see there's three records in the database, so the first one, only the first is one. The second time it shows up, neither the first nor the last are equal to one, and the last time it shows up, the third time, um, first is equal to zero and last is equal to one. So you can sort of see how this applies uh, as you go through and, and why it would create this and why it could be helpful in you trying to pick out the records that you're interested in. Um, so I just make a note here, which I think I already mentioned, but given that the data set is sorted by SIPC ID and the diagnosis date, when you take the observations on first.sipsy ID, you get the earliest diagnosis in the, in the data set. So it's really important to pay attention to how you've sorted the data set before you actually set it by something. Now, whenever you um, set a data set by a variable or by a series of variables in SAS, because it doesn't have to be a single variable, it does have to be sorted in that order. So in actual fact, if I hadn't sorted the data set by SIPC ID in the previous proc sort, um, it would actually, SAS would actually give you an error and say, I can't do this because it's not sorted in the appropriate order. But here you'll notice that the sort actually is by SIPC ID and diagnosis date, but when I've set it, I've only set it by SIPC ID. So this, that extra bit of sorting is going to help me in terms of selecting um, the diagnosis that I want. So coming back to the merge example now. So now I'm going to use the diagnosis file D2, which I described how we created that, as the stem data set and add other information from other tables to it. <clears throat> so if I want to add the gender information that comes from the info table, I'm going to create a data set called O, and I'm going to set into it the info table, and then I'm only going to keep the SIPC ID and gender. You don't necessarily need to subset or keep only the data variables or data elements that you're interested in, although I think it's good form and it stops your data sets from getting too large and you carrying extra variables that you don't need. Um, and then, because I'm actually only adding gender, I'm actually just going to create a data set called O2. I'm going to set it by SIPC ID and take the first time that it shows up. And presumably, if the person's been entered in the database multiple times, um, which it, it may or may not have been, depending on how your data was structured, um, their gender shouldn't differ. So I'm just going to take the first one. So ultimately, before I merge something, I have to sort the two data sets that I'm interested in, and I have to sort them by the merge key that I'm actually going to use. So here I'm going to merge by SIPC ID. So here I've just sorted the O2 and the D2 data set. And then subsequently I'm going to um, create, now I'm going to create a data set called D2. And I've created a few data sets here. I've created D2, A, B, and C. So I've actually created four data sets. So I've said to SAS, create four data sets for me. And this might be the first time that you've seen this code where we're creating more than one data set in a single data step. Um, but you're welcome to create as many data sets, actually. Well, maybe not as many. SAS will have a limit, but the limit will be quite large. Um, and then subsequently, I've now said I actually want to merge two data sets. So the command is actually merge. So I want to merge D2 and O2 together. And then in parenthesis behind each of the data sets that I want to merge here, you'll notice that I've said in equals in1 or in equals in2. And this is saying to me, or this is telling SAS that I actually want to create a variable called in1 that is equal to the in operator that I explained earlier. So this will create that flag, 
that's a zero or a one, depending on whether the observation that we're looking at came from the data set D2. And subsequently, on the O2 in2 function, it's going to create a variable called in2, and that in2 is going to be equal to zero or one, depending on whether that observation was in the O2 data set. And then ultimately, I say what I want to merge it by, and here I want to merge it by SIPCID. And then I have to say, what do I want to do with all this information? And here is the reason why I created the A, B, and C data set. And so the first uh, value that comes after the by statement says, if in 1 equals 1, then output it to D2. So here I'm just saying, look, if, if the observation came from D2, I want you to output it to D2. And this means that if it, even if it didn't find a match in O2, I still would like you to keep records of those, um, or I'd like you to keep those observations in the data set. But now subsequently I define what goes into data set A, B, and C. So in the first data set A, I'm saying keep only the observations where it's in both data sets. So that's in 1 equals 1 and in 2 equals 1. So this is now data, data set A is now only going to contain observations where um, they were found in both data sets. And in B, I'm now going to have only observations that were contained in O2 but didn't have a match in D2. Um, and subsequently in data set 3, I'm going to have only observations that were in D2 but didn't show up in O2. Now, because I've subset this data to only keep the first observation in the in the O data set, the info data set with gender in it, my expectation is, is that in actual fact this should be a one-to-one -one, uh, or a one-to-many merge, because there might be multiple diagnoses in my diagnosis data set, although thinking back, I actually subset that to take only the first diagnosis and the first primary. So in actual fact here, my expectation is, is that this should be a one-to-one -one merge. So I would run this and see what happened, basically. And basically, I'm going to create four data sets here, and each data set is going to tell me what's happening. So um, this just goes through the code a little bit more detail as I was already talking. So what does SAS actually do? So this just gives you an example of what SAS will do as it weaves these two things together. Um, but you'll notice here that SIPC ID is the merging variable that puts all of this data together. And you'll notice that actually um, in the SIPC, in the diagnostic table, you'll notice here that we have SIPC ID 1001, 2, 4, and 5. So 3 is missing. But in the info table, I have 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5 is missing. So when SAS actually tries to merge these data sets together, you'll get the data set at the bottom, which now includes a record for 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And you'll notice that the diagnosis data set, or the merge data set, is missing the diagnosis for um, for uh, record 1003 because it didn't exist in the diagnosis data set. And likewise, for observation 1005 or SIPC ID 1005, you'll notice there's no gender information because there was no gender information to bring over from the gender table. And here I've highlighted the in variables that are created. So here, in 1 is telling us that it came from the diagnosis table. And 1000, record 1001 did come from the diagnosis table. And in 2 says it also came from that table. So it actually also found a match for SIPC ID of 1001 in the diagnosis table. So that, barrier, that record, that observation basically could, was a combination of both uh, data sets. Likewise for 1002, it's a combination of both. But you'll notice once we get to 1003 that, as I said, this in file is telling us in one is zero, which means it did not find a, a matching record um, in the diagnosis table. And likewise, when you get to 1005, again, this is telling us in two is equal to zero now, so it's telling us that in one is equal to one, so the record came from the diagnosis table, but that it did not find a match in the uh, patient table or the info table. So subsequently, all of those commands that I gave you then picks the subsets of the variables that I'm interested in. Remember that the D2 data set, the merge data set that I'm creating, um, only selected all variables where the in1 equal to 1. So if in1 was there, it selected it. 
So here it would only take um, 1001, 2, 4, and 5. But in the subsequent A, B, and C um, data sets that I created, it will have a combination of all of these things. And when you look in the log, which is what I'm showing you here now, it will actually show you uh, what's happened or how many observations ended up in each one. So at the top, when you look at the PROC sort data 02, it tells you that there's 11,852 observations read in from that data set. And when you look at the data for D2, it tells you there's 11,805. So right away, you know that this is not going to be a one-to-one -one merge because there's a different number of observations in each data set. And just because the observations or numbers are exactly the same doesn't necessarily mean that it will be one-to-one -one either because they could have the same number of observations but actually have different values in them. Um, but it, it does give you some information already telling you that in actual fact this can't be a one-to-one -one merge. Ultimately, you run the merge code that's there, and what does the log tell you? Well, the log tells you that it found um, 11,805 for D2 and 11,852 for O2. And that the subsequent data set D2 that it created um, has 11,805 observations in it and 38 variables. And so here is where I'm checking to make sure that the merge is doing what I expected it to. So here, the D2 data set does include the same number of variables, or the same number of observations that was in the original D2 data set as I'd specified, because I said if in one equals one, then output it to D2. And then now when we get down into data sets A, B, and C, we see a little bit more information about what's going on. So in data set A should be everyone that found a match, so everyone that had an observation in both data sets, and that's 11,805. And so that seems reasonable to me. And what that's telling me is, is that actually all data from the diagnosis table did find a gender match, which is fantastic. Subsequently, data set B, which only contains information from the um, info table, there were 47 observations in it. So this tells me that there were 47 observations from the gender table that did not find a match in the diagnosis table. And you might say, well, why is that? Well, you have to remember that I subset the diagnosis information to include only the first diagnosis for every patient, and I subsequently took only first primary. So this means that there are some individuals that I removed from that data set originally that are still in the O2 data set that don't have a match. And then finally, the C data set should be everybody that was in the diagnosis table but couldn't find a gender match. And you'll notice here that it's zero observations in this data set. And that's exactly what I'm hoping for, because that tells me that, in fact, everybody in my diagnosis data set did have a, did have a gender um, merge, essentially. So this gives me a lot of important information about how to control the merge and what actually was happening. And if these values uh, came back and they weren't what I expected, so I didn't have a zero in, in data set C, I would actually have to go back and investigate why um, some of the observations in the diagnosis data set couldn't find a gender. So maybe it was that a gender was never entered or that somehow you subset the data and it didn't, the gender table didn't include all the observations that you needed, et cetera. But it would at least tell you that there was some, uh, some reason to go back and investigate a little bit further about what's going on. So this is essentially what I mean by controlling the merge and thinking through um, uh, how SAS is actually putting all of these pieces together. So as a little aside, the other thing that you can do is something called concatenation. And concatenation really appends one data set uh, on the bottom of the other. And so this would be the code that you would use to concatenate instead of merge. So here I'm creating a data set called new, and I'm setting into it D2 and O2, and then running it. And so this is, this is no longer going to merge the data sets by some identifier. It's no longer going to weave the data sets together. It's simply just going to append one under the other. So here are the two data sets that I have, and ultimately what you end up with is the data set at the bottom, and you can see that in actual fact what's happened is it hasn't woven any of the data together. It's simply just appended it on the bottom. Now in this case, it seems a little silly to do this. Why would you want to concatenate these two data sets? And I agree there, there probably isn't a reason why you would want to do that here. But sometimes you might subset your data to put all older patients in one data set and all younger patients in another data set. And ultimately, at some point, you want to maybe bring them all back together. 
And if that's the case, maybe concatenation is the way to go. Um, so there are these sort of two ways to sort of push data sets together in SAS. One is actually merging them, which kind of, as I said, weaves the data sets together. And the other would be concatenation, where you just sort of append or subset the data one after the other into the new data set. So you have to decide what's the most appropriate for what it is that you're trying to do or accomplish. So now we're going to move on and talk about arrays. And arrays in SAS um, really help you reduce the amount of code that you're writing. And it's also very helpful when you're trying to process a group of variables in the same way. So if you're trying to do the exact same thing to multiple variables, it sometimes will save you a lot of code. And the less code you type, the less mistakes actually I find that people make. Um, it also improves faster processing time. Now the faster processing time is in some ways not really an issue with the SIPSI data. The data set that we're using here in SIPSI is small by data standards. Um, so the faster processing time probably isn't a major issue for us. Um, you know, SAS is going to be able to process uh, the amount of information in the SIPSI data set probably within seconds on most deployments. Uh, but you can imagine if you were working with millions of records um, that sometimes a faster processing time would be something that you would want. And I have certainly written SAS programs that have taken days to actually execute just based on the size of the data sets. So you're always looking for ways to simplify your code and improve it. So I think the reasons really that you'd want to use arrays here is really to reduce the amount of code that you're writing so it actually not only speeds up the code you're, that you're writing, but it also means that you're less likely to make um, errors when you're actually coding. So moving on to um, one of the data tables that comes out of the SIPSI data set for this request that we've asked for is the cytogenetics data. And here's an example of the cytogenetics data table that comes out. And you'll notice here that there are repeats of the SIPSI ID. Again, we're in a relational database. This is what we expect. And for every um, cytogenetic test that's, that's done uh, that SIPSI records, there's a separate record in the cytogenetics table for this. And so you can see that there were two cytogenetic uh, reports that came back for patient 1024. There was only one that came back for 1027. There were three that came back for 1029. And there was one that came back for 1043 and one for 1049. So I've only given you a snapshot, obviously, of the entire database here. But you can imagine how if I was trying to create a database of diagnoses, that I would have to figure out how to add the cytogenetics data back in in one particular line. So how do I reformulate or restructure this data set to get it so that it's only one observation per SIPSI ID? Well, one of the ways to do that is through an array. So here we have the cytogenetics data, and as I said, where each cytogenetic result is in a separate observation. But ultimately, what we want to do is we want to add this information to the subjects database or the diagnosis database. And first, we would need to restructure this so that the data set is wider rather than long. And um, this is a term that you often hear, wide versus long data sets. And really what it means is, in a relational sense, is really turning it into a, a flatter file that happens to get a little bit fatter, but it is flatter in the sense that we're only going to have one observation per SIPSI ID in the new data set. But ultimately, if we want to keep all that information that was in that data set, we're actually going to have to append it out to the left. So it's going to get wider, but shorter. So how would we go about doing this? Well, we would sort the data set first. Uh, here we're working with a data set called C3, which is for cytogenetics. Um, and we're going to sort it by SIPSI ID. And then ultimately, we're now going to create a new data set called C4. And originally, we're going to start by creating an array. And it says array C. And in square brackets, it has a 5. And then it has a dollar sign and cyto1 dash cyto5. So what this says to SAS is create an array called C um, that has five elements in it, hence the 5 in the brackets. They're all going to be character. And that they're going to be named CYTO1 to CYTO5. So I could have typed out CYTO1 space CYTO2 space CYTO3 space all the way up to CYTO5, but SAS allows you to put a dash between it if you have a sequence number on the end of the variable name. Um, so it's going to create these new variables, and it's going to set them inside this array called C. 
And then ultimately the next step says do i equals 1 to 5 until last.sipcid. So remember that when I set a data set by a variable, it creates the first and last dot um, values for you or, or variables so that you can use them in your coding. And so here it tells SAS, do I from one to five until you hit the last SIPC ID. So the last SIPC ID here, I could have specified last SIPC equals one, uh, but SAS just understands that just by putting last.sipc ID. And so basically what it's going to do, it's going to process uh, up to five times for each SIPC ID, um, or if you have less than five cytogenetics records within each SIPC ID, it'll, it'll stop processing when it hits the last SIPC ID. So if you only had two records, it'll only process to two, but at maximum here, I'm only going to take five. So even if a, even if a patient had 15 cytogenetics records, for them, this data, this um, code, the way I've written it, would only take the first five. Um, so the next one, the next bit of code here says set C3. So now I'm going to set the C3 by the SIPC ID. So the interesting part here that I have to point out is that normally we have a data, uh, the data command where we say data, in this case C4, and we immediately move to the set command. And here you'll notice that actually the set command comes after um, describing the array and the do loop, and that's kind of important for the way that this functions. So the next bit of code here says C, and in brackets it says I equals PCH test. So here the CI refers to the array name C that we created with the five variables cytal one to five in it, and the I refers to the I in the do loop. So here we've said do i equals 1 to 5. So when i equals 1, then cyto1 is going to equal p ch test. And when i is equal to 2, then it's actually going to refer to the second variable in the array, and therefore it's going to refer to cyto2 equals ph test, and so on and so forth, up to the fifth cytogenetic variable that, we, that we're creating. And so this way, the program is actually going to cycle through. Every, for every SIPC ID, it's going to do 1 to 5 um, or until the last SIPC ID. So if there's only one record or there's no records, it'll just stop as soon as it hits the last SIPC ID. But at maximum, it will do 5. And it will cycle through each five of them, and it will pull that out and set the information that's in PCH test, that variable name, into CYTO1 to CYTO5, depending on where we are in the do loop. And then at the very end of this program, I say if last.sipcid, then output. So if I've hit the last sipcid, and then what I want to do is output the variables cyto1 to 5 into the data set. So this is where it's actually going to output the values of cyto1 to 5 into the C4 data set. So it's going to cycle through and do this for each and every sipcid that you have. Um, and once it gets all finished, you need a run command at the end or an end command at the end, sorry, and a run command. So what does the revised cytogenetics data look like? So this is the original cytogenetics data set, and after we write the cytogenetic, or after we run that code, this is the cytogenetics data set as it would look. It actually would have cyto4 and 5 here, and it would probably be blank for most of them, because in the, well, at least the code that I showed you here, no one had more than three. But you can see that in the original data set, SIPC ID 1024 had two entries, and now you can see that the first entry is in CYTO1 and the second entry is in CYTO2. And for um, SIPC ID 1027, it only had one entry, uh, and so you can see that that information is stored in CYTO1. For um, SIPC ID 1029, they had three entries, and you can see that the first one is now stored in CYTO1, the second one is stored in CYTO2, and the third one is stored in CYTO3, and so on and so forth. So you can see how that we've gone from a long data set uh, to a shorter data set, but a wider one. So the data set's actually gotten a little bit wider. But what this restructuring allows me to do is now merge my new uh, data set with the data set of the patients and add all that cytogenetics information to a data set that contains only the individual. So that's just an example of uh, array processing and how it may actually help you uh, move forward and process uh, the data that you're interested in and or reshape some of the data that you're interested in.
generally speaking, I look at all of the data elements that I want in my analysis data set at the end, and I plan that out up front. And then I manipulate the data using these data techniques that I've given you to get to the data set that I want. So here, I only wanted the first five set of genetics for each individual, and I just wanted to append them uh, onto the main diagnosis table, and hence why I just restructured the cytogenetics data. If I had just merged the cytogenetics data um, as it was in a long form, it would actually repeat, if you will, all of the diagnostic information for every set of genetics record that was there. And it can be sometimes difficult to work with when it has multiple records per person like that. So on to macro processing. So just a little bit about basic macros in SAS. So SAS has this macro language, and it really helps you, again, accomplish repetitive tasks more efficiently. So this is similar in the sense that it will help you re refine your code and do things a little bit more efficiently. And it basically allows you to assign a string, characters or words, a string in SAS is just really a set of characters or words, to a variable, and then be able to substitute that variable anywhere in the program. So I do note here, though, that I, this really is basic macro. So I'm just presenting you here the most simple use of the macro language. And certainly there are many books and many examples online where you can find much more complicated macros. And if you get into macros and start using them in your SAS program, you'll find that actually you find more and more ways to use them. And you may need more and more information, which is available in various books and online. So um, we'll just focus on the most simple use of the macros. But I do find the macros very, very handy particularly in data manipulation, but I also find the macros quite handy um, when we will move on to more of the procedure steps and analysis, particularly when I want to run analysis, the same analysis on multiple different subsets uh, when I'm doing sensitivity analysis, for example. It saves me having to write a lot of code. So this is the first sort of example of a basic SAS macro. So there's a percent let and the percent is a is a reserved character in SAS. So when you put a percent in front of a in front of a name, it tells it that you're working in a macro environment. And it says percent let save time equal to if you were going to type this all the time. So really, what I've done is I've just created this macro variable called save time, and in save time is whatever has been stored in that quotes. And here I said, you know, if you were going to type this value all the time, you could actually just put it into a macro variable and then use it. And here I'm using the PROC print procedure. I'm going to print various variables, but in the title I'm just going to call it save time. So it would, if I'm going to use that same title over and over again on a whole bunch of output, I can actually just assign it to a macro variable and then insert it into the program at any point. So you'll notice that I use the percent to define the macro. So that tells SAS when I use a percent and a name that I'm actually trying to use the macro language. And then when I actually go to use the variable that was created in the macro language, I have to put an ampersand in front of it. So here you'll notice that it says title ampersand save time. So you can imagine that in SIPC, or when I'm doing analysis using SIPC data, there is an enormous list of variables that I often will use um, in various ways, either in the keep statements, so I always want to keep this set of variables, or in the procedure statements where I always want to print or frequency these variables. So instead of having to type out this giant list, which you see here, and sometimes the names are quite difficult to type because they're not intuitive, you know, there's lots of double underscores and single underscores and various things that go on. So instead I can type the list once and I can assign it to a, to a, a macro variable called list. And then I can subsequently use that in my program. So here I say percent let list equals this series of text. And so every time now I refer to the macro variable list, it will just substitute in this giant list of variables. So here I have data temp, set D2, keep SIPSI ID, and the list of variables, this ampersand list. So we'll just substitute in that entire list of variables. So you can see that if you're using the same list over and over again, it can sometimes be helpful um, to just have this as a macro variable to use. It'll save you a lot of time of typing uh, and retyping or having to cut and paste a whole bunch of things in your code. So just to sort of reiterate what I've talked about, the SAS macro programming statements are always preceded by a percent sign. So when you have a percent sign and, a, and some text following it, it's telling SAS that actually you're going to use the macro language. 
And that SAS macro variables, when you go to use them, are always preceded by the ampersand sign. So those are sort of the two key pieces that you have to know right now in order to use macros. But here's another example of a macro that's a little bit more complicated and one, than, in fact, that I actually use. And this macro actually assigns the IEEC, the International Classification of Childhood Cancers, and this is for version three. This macro basically goes through and uses a number of different macro variables to assign this code. So it saves me from having to retype this code all the time. I can just save it as a macro and then call it up whenever I need to use it. And so I'll just walk you through the actual creation of this macro. So you'll notice here that here we have the percent macro. So it tells SAS that I'm now going to create a macro. And I'm going to create a macro that's called ICCC, and it's going to have seven variables. And the variables are going to be in, out, T code, M code, ICCC, ICCC M, and behavior. So those are the various variables that I'm going to use or be able to substitute in the code. So then subsequently, I create a data set out and a data set in. Um, and you'll notice that I now put an ampersand in front of out and an ampersand in front of in, because that's now going to substitute whatever text I have in the first place of the macro where it says in. It'll just substitute that in the program. At the end, and the second after the comma is the out variable, and so it'll just substitute wherever it finds ampersand out. It'll substitute that text in. So, and then that basically follows through for all the variables that I've specified here. In fact, uh, behavior actually isn't used in this bit of code. You'll see some dot, dot, dots. The code is much, much longer. In actual fact, uh, I'm just showing you here how to code actually the first two um, categories for ICCC. But you'll see here at the end now I've said percent %MN. So that actually is a SAS command that says percent %macro end. So this says this is the end of my macro coding. So what's ever between the percent macro and the percent m end is considered the macro program. And in actual fact, when you run that in SAS, when you highlight it and run it, it compiles that information, but it doesn't actually do anything, because all it does is store this code and says, well, you haven't asked me to do anything with this code at this point. So the way to get SAS to do something with the code is to then call up that code. And the way that you call up that code is with that last line of code at the bottom. So here, again, now I have a percent, and I say percent IEEC. And this actually calls macro IEEC, which is defined in the code above, and says the first variable is going to be defined as D2, the second variable, which is out, is going to be defined as temp, the third variable, which is T code, is actually the variable in the data set where the T code is stored, and that's called ICDO underscore T underscore code, and so on and so forth for the seven variables that I'm interested in. So here is where I actually call up the macro and I tell it what values I would like it to substitute for me in that code when I run it. And so above here is the actual macro code and the call, and down below is actually what happens when you substitute it. So this is actually what, what happens when you run this code is the frame below. So in the frame below it says data D2, semicolon set temp. And so you can see here that the first code in the macro says data ampersand out, semicolon set ampersand in. And so you can see that in the code that I called, the percent IEEC, the last line of the upper frame, it says the in data set should be D2. Actually, I've substituted this incorrectly. I'm sorry. It should be, that should be temp. Um, and the out data set would be there. So it just basically substitutes the text throughout and it saves you basically from writing this code. And because I run this code very frequently, and sometimes I get data sets where the, where the values of the variable names are slightly different, I don't have to go back through and change all of the code for every time that uh, the T code is referred to or the M code is referred to. I can just in the macro language change the actual variable name, and it will then go in and substitute all of those for me. So it really speeds up my programming for things that I want to do frequently. So I think that was all I was going to present today, but just to just reiterate what we covered today, we just, again, talked about SAS and the overview and really that we're still focusing on this data step. Um, and then I talked at length about merging data sets, and you can either weave them together with the merge or you can even concatenate them depending on what it is that you're looking to do.
And then I talked about using arrays in your program as a way to shorten the code and potentially make less errors, and also how you might use macros for things that you do frequently or for long strings of text that you want to be able to substitute in various ways. So I think that was it, and we'll maybe ask Randy to unmute, and uh, I'll take any questions that people might have. Unmuted. Thanks, Jason. Everyone should be unmuted now if they have questions. Great. So if anyone has any questions. Maybe everyone's just excited and is rushing off to use SAS to analyze their data. We can hope. I did hear a little bit of a laugh in the background. All right, so if there's no questions, I think we'll um, call this session closed. Uh, our next session is scheduled um, for June 9th, uh, so a couple of weeks from today. Um, and actually, Dr. Laura Rosella from the University of Toronto uh, is going to be coming to talk to us about tips and tricks for secondary grant writing. Um, Dr. Rosella is a large data user here in Ontario, um, and so doesn't have any particular knowledge about pediatric cancer, but does have a lot of knowledge about um, how to write a good grant or a proposal for how you might use administrative and or secondary data like SIPSI data. Uh, in, a, in a framework to help you basically tips and tricks for writing those things. So Dr. Rizal will be presenting that on June 9th, and we'll send it a little bit more information closer to the date. So thank you all for joining today. Excellent. Thanks again, Jason. And Randy, you'll be sending out um, all of these presentations for us so we can keep them for when we are writing code? Yep, and the, the previous ones are already on the C17 website. This one will go up shortly. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, so just Stacy, in reference to that, we've been loading both the slides and um, and each of the recorded talks when we've been able to get the recordings back. So they're already there, and you can watch them as much as you want. Perfect. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye.